All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, it looks like we still have some people who are um, continuing to get connected, but I want to be mindful of everybody's time and officially get our program started today. Thank you so much for joining us for one of our virtual summer programs for parents and families at Dickinson. My name is Sarah Maslin Fathery. I'm the Director of Parent Relations at the college, and it's nice to be able to virtually welcome you to the parent community. Um, thank you for making time in the middle of your day to connect with us. I know that this can be challenging for some people, but I, I hope that today we're able to provide you with some really wonderful information that will be useful to you and to your family as you prepare to come to Dickinson. Um, the program that we're offering today is the second of eight events that we're hosting this summer, again, with the intention of sharing as much information with you as possible as we can leading up to your arrival on campus in August so that when you arrive, you're able to really have a positive experience, a memorable experience, and hopefully one where you feel well informed and ready to um, support your student as they transition to life at Dickinson. Today, we're going to focus on Dickinson's approach to residence life and housing for our students, which I know is an area that families have tons of questions about, um, particularly at this point in the summer as you're awaiting roommate assignments and room assignments, there are a lot of questions. And um, my colleague Amanda George will be focusing on the first year student experience, but we'll also cover some useful information for you that will help you to better understand what your student can expect over the next four years of their Dickinson experience. Um, the program is being recorded and for those who have asked, we will be posting it and sharing it on the website and on Facebook when we're able to download it and get that prepared for you. Um, you'll see that the Q&A feature should be enabled for you and I will do my best to manage the questions as they're coming in and feed them to Amanda through the presentation and we'll go through some of them as well at the end of the presentation. Um, if you have a really specific question that is, you know, very specific to your student and to your family, you can also feel free to follow up with us individually and we'll give you that contact information at the end of the presentation just to make sure that we address all of your questions. Um, so with that, I think that that's all I need to share with you up front. Um, so I'd like to introduce my colleague, Amanda George, who is the Associate Dean and Director of Residence Life and Housing and Conduct, and she will be sharing some great information with you here today. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you for inviting me um, to chat with folks. This is the first um, time we've done something like this over the summer, and so I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to talk with each of you. Some of you I was able to meet virtually um, in the spring as you're making some decisions through admissions events, and I'm so glad um, that all of you have joined us here today and, and uh, look forward to meeting you in person in uh, about a month and a half, I guess. We're getting pretty close, a little bit, almost two months. Um, so, as Sarah mentioned, my name is Amanda. I work with residence life and housing and conduct. That's a little side thing. Uh, but today we're here to focus on residence life and housing. And so just a little bit about our office and our philosophy. Um, so our goal, what we strive to do is to create environments where folks can, where students can practice the skills that they're learning during their time here at Dickinson. Um, you chose Dickinson for a reason, and while they vary, hopefully a piece of that was about that learning experience and what you hope your student will gain while they're here and the skills that they'll come out of this experience having knowledge of and being able to practice, including practicing that in the residential environment. So we'll talk a little bit more about those skills and what we hope that they get out of this a little bit more on, but that influences everything we do. It's our goal to make sure that folks are leaving their, this experience, um, having grown and becoming stronger in certain skills that they're um, ready to take on the world, ready to become um, engaged citizens and leaders of the global world. Uh, today, I'm going to share a little bit of information about our office, um, living on campus, resources available, and and also about um, how you can support and help your student in their transition to living on campus. Um, some of your students may be living at home with you. Some may have had some boarding school experience or camp experience where they have lived um, separately for a while. But most of them probably have not lived on Dickinson's campus. So I want to be able to give you some information so that you can help your student as they navigate this. I'm going to start by talking about some of the fantastic people I work with. I just need to advance my slide. Um, so we have a lot of really great people on campus who are eager to help and support your student. Um, our resident advisors go through um, a 
competitive process in the spring of the previous previous year um, to be selected as RAs. These are folks, these are peers who are serving as mentors, help, helping connect folks to resources and encouraging community development. These are folks who can teach your uh, students the best calf hacks as they're called, right? How to, how to make a meal out of some of the stuff that's in the calf that's a little more unique. Um, my favorite one is when a student taught me how to make a quesadilla that I don't know why I didn't think about that before, but it's my favorite. Um, RAs can help students figure out what buildings their classes are in, how to submit a work order, um, how to have tough conversations with roommates. They're that peer support that can help with some of those day-to-day -day questions and concerns that come up um, as your student navigates and joins the Dickinson community. In addition to our RAs, we have area coordinators. These are folks who have advanced degrees their professional staff who live in some of our halls. So they're on campus. We have a 24-7 um, presence on campus with professional staff members who are available and they oversee areas um, and supervise the RAs. We also work with some really great partners, including facilities management. They have oversight of the facilities and the buildings. So those are the folks that we're calling when something goes wrong with the building. Um, and then our, our colleagues in Department of Public Safety, DPS, they also provide 24 seven assistance for students. And so um, oftentimes you'll hear your student calling public safety for something You're like, that sounds odd, but they're available 24 seven. So at 2 a.m., they're the folks we're gonna call to get resources to help your student. Um, a little bit about first year housing, what's already happened and then what will happen moving forward. So uh, the housing agreement and roommate, roommate preference form for first years was due, was due July 1. And so most uh, folks have already done that. We take that information and over the course of the next month, we work on assigning roommates and assigning housing. About 40% of the folks who have the for incoming first years um, requested a roommate. And so that leaves about 60 who will be assigned by us using the information that they shared with us. So that's helpful to know. I hear from students and families who are concerned that their students didn't identify a roommate, didn't pick a roommate in advance, and they're worried that everyone else did. And so that's helpful to, for folks to know that only about 40% um, chose a roommate, requested a roommate this year. Um, if it's a mutual request, generally we're able to accommodate it. Um, if it's not mutual, usually we'll reach out and ask some questions about whether it was just forgotten or whether it was a mistake and try to work with that. That's some of the stuff we're doing in the next month or so. Um, a few years ago, we did a little bit of a mini research assessment project, which sounds boring, but there's a reason I'm sharing this with you. Um, we wanted to know what was the most important thing in the roommate relationship. So we had focus groups and a survey for first year students in their spring semester who had been living with a roommate, both those we had paired and those who had requested their roommate. That helped us learn a little bit more about what was important for students in their roommate relationship. And so your student filled out a very long questionnaire with a lot of different information about themselves. We take all of that into account, but there are some things that we prioritize. So we learned that cleanliness, studying, and how you're gonna use the room are three of the most important things for students when living with somebody. How they're gonna share that space together is important. We take into account all of the other information they provided us as well, but those are some of the critical important factors that we focus on. This helps us prioritize um, what's most important to a student and helping connect them um, with a roommate. So as I mentioned, we do that throughout the month of July and then students can expect to receive their housing assignment and roommate information the first week of August. Sometimes we get it a little bit sooner, but generally we promise it by the first week in August and they'll receive an email um, sharing how to access that information. It's helpful to know that um, most first years will live in double rooms. There are some singles available and there are some triples, but most of our first years live in double rooms. When students receive information about their roommate, I would really encourage them to reach out to that person, either via cell, via email, whatever works for them. Um, we've had some folks who rely on social media rather than um, getting to know the person through talking. And while um, that's a great way to get to know somebody, we also know that probably only maybe about 10% of our lives are on social media. There's a lot of things that we don't put out there. And so I always encourage folks to connect with their roommate, um, whether it's texting, phone call, email, whatever makes sense, so that they can really get to know them. It also helps with planning on talking about what you're going to bring to the room. 
So this is a list of things that are provided in the room. So a bed, a desk, a desk chair, a bookshelf, and clothing storage that includes drawers and um, hanger space for folks. Each building will vary. And even within the building, you may have different styles of furniture. And so some will be, for example, some bookshelves will be the ones that you set on top of a desk and others may be the ones that are on a floor more traditional bookshelf. All of our buildings have air conditioning. Some have central air and some have window units. Um, AC is typically available through from the summer until about October when we start to see colder weather here in Carlisle. Um, and at that point, um, we'll kind of turn the air off and we'll wait until it gets, um, starts to get very cold. There's always that shoulder season where it's a hot day and then a cold day right back to right after another. But once it gets consistently cold, then the heat will be turned on. And then the same thing happens in the spring. All of our buildings are locked 24 seven. And so um, first years will have an ID card that they use to access the building where they live. They can only access the building they live. So if they're visiting somebody else, usually they would meet them at the door to let them in and to greet them. And then they also have a key that they use for their bedroom. I, this seems so an odd thing to bring up, but it's really important. One of the biggest struggles that I hear from first year students, new students, is that they struggle to remember to take their key places with them. It's an odd, Thing that just a lot of folks don't have to do while living at home. And so if you can start practicing that now, it may be helpful in getting used to taking a key with you when you leave. Because um, folks lock themselves out of their room a lot, or worse, they leave the door unlocked, which while we're a very safe campus, I still encourage folks to take measures to make themselves and their personal property safe as well. There is a long list on our website. If you go to Dickinson edu and look up our greener packing list. This is just a snippet of some of the things that you may want to bring. Um, our beds are twin XL. So if you go to any store, Walmart, Target, Amazon, if you're buying the twin XL, twin extra long, linens will work. Um, some other things you may want to bring are listed here. I encourage folks to avoid the laundry pods if possible. They can sometimes um, cause some damage to the laundry machines and make them less effective, but some people still bring them. Um, a shower caddy is helpful as you're taking stuff from your room to the shower and so something to carry your toiletry items in. Shower shoes, a lot of people use flip-flops. Um, we have housekeepers who clean the bathrooms regularly, but you're still sharing a communal space with other people. So shower shoes are often a good idea. What to leave at home, alcohol if you're under 21 or living with somebody who's under 21, which is likely most of our first year students. Um, pets other than fish, open heating elements, heated blankets, decorative string lights, candles, and things that could damage walls. Uh, so move in. Move in is probably one of my favorite days of the year. Um, there's so much energy and I'm very excited that we get to go back to a more traditional move in. Last year due to COVID, it was adjusted um, because we we're concerned about having so many folks in a congregating in one area. But this year we get to go back to that high energy excitement, which is amazing. Um, if you, if your student is a fall athlete or if they're an international student who fall into some certain circumstances, they may be arriving early. If that's true, they would have heard from their coach or CGSE directly. If you have questions about that, feel free to reach out. We can talk about that. The majority of first year students will be coming on August 25th between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. That's the moving day for first years. Um, around the first week of August, students will sign up for a check-in time within that period. It'll help us distribute traffic into the building throughout that time. We encourage folks to label their belongings with their name, their building, and their room number. When you drive up to the building on that 25th, you'll be greeted by tons of people. As you can see, this is a picture from a move-in day a few years ago, um, cheering with excitement. Um, these are folks that'll help your student move their belongings into their room. And so because you'll be having so much help, it would be ideal if they label them so that they know where they're going with the belongings. Um, so it's an important note as you're starting, a lot of folks are maybe starting to get ready and start to pack and think about what you want to bring in August. Um, while I'm focusing this presentation primarily on first year students, I think it's also helpful to talk a lot, a little bit about what to expect in future years. Um, what should upper class, what should your student expect in their sophomore, junior, and senior year? So hopefully by now you know that we have a four-year residency requirement. This means that students live on campus all four years unless they're living 
working locally with their families. So we have a handful of commuter students who live in Carlisle with their families and commute into in for classes, but the majority of our students are living on campus. Typically, sophomores will live in traditional doubles and sometimes they'll live in suites. Juniors will live typically in suites, although sometimes they'll all choose to live in traditional doubles. Seniors could expect to live in singles and more independent housing, such as apartments and small housing. So I share that because um, I think it's important to know that in the first few years, your students on campus, they'll be typically living in more traditional spaces where there's um, support from RAs and other staff members in the hopes that they'll get they'll gain those skills, practice those skills to live more independently by their senior year in some apartments and small houses. Um, students select housing through a randomized lottery process, which prioritizes seniority. So that means uh, upper class students, when it comes time to select housing, seniors would select first, then juniors, and then sophomores. And within that, they're assigned a randomized lottery time. We communicate um, usually around January, February with students about what to expect as they select housing. They typically select housing in April for the upcoming year. Um, so as we get closer, just encourage your student to read their emails. Oftentimes they're long because they have a lot of information. We try to make it as accessible as possible, but it can be overwhelming. So encourage them to reach out if they have any questions. I'm going to talk a little bit about our four years residency requirement and why we have it and why it is such an important piece of our campus and our culture. So there's some things that we know about living on campus. So I'm getting my notes. There are some things I just wanted to make sure I didn't forget to say and I had to get my notes organized. Um, so these are things that we know from research um, done by about students who are living on campus, not necessarily on Dickinson campus, but nationally. So we know that students living on campus have a higher GPA than those living off campus. We know that they engage more often with specifically faculty, but also their peers and the greater campus community. So generally more um, involved in clubs and organizations. We also know they're more likely to persist, they're more likely to stay in school, and they're also more likely to graduate on time. In addition to that, as I mentioned in the very beginning, our hope is that as students live on campus, they gain some important skills that'll help them in the future. These are skills that employers are looking for um, in future opportunities. Um, they're listed here, self-awareness, empathy, tolerance for ambiguity, flexibility thought and behavior, patience, curiosity, and active listening. So we hope this is a fun experience and we know that it is for most of our students to live in a community with their peers, to do that light, late night pizza order, to watch movies, to go to those programming um, hosted by the RAs. And while doing that, we also recognize that students are learning a lot by living with their peers, by living a community, by living independently and dealing with the challenges that come up with that as well. And so that's why our four-year residency requirement is so important to us and why um, it's important to me as well. It's one of the reasons that um, I chose Dickinson and one of the reasons that I work in residence life is the value that I see um, as folks live on campus and live among their peers. Um, so I want to shift a little bit to talking about how you can help support your student. So we have similar goals. I'm making an assumption that we have similar goals. That uh, My hope is that when your student graduates here in four years, they're coming out stronger, confident, and they have those skills to continue um, to succeed in life. And so we have, we have that same idea. We hope that your students do that. And so we can often partner um, in how to help your student do that. You play a significant role in that and helping them grow in their confidence and helping them grow during their time here and, and, and supporting them as they uh, resolve to, as they try to problem solve and solve any issues that come up. Um, when students come with us to concerns, often we'll ask them, okay, what have you done? What would you like to see moving forward? And what are some options that you have? Especially with first year students, sometimes they may not know all their options. So a lot of, a lot of what my work is, is sharing the options with them. And as parents, you can do something similar, talking about what the issue is, what's going on, and what are some of the resources on campus that can help support them through this. If parents call, generally we're gonna to wanna to talk to the student. That doesn't mean we don't wanna to talk to you because as I mentioned, we often have the same goal and can help partner in things. We're also gonna to wanna to hear from the student about their experience, what's going on and how they wanna move forward. 
there are future sessions that'll go into more detail about this. And so I think Sarah could provide some information about the future sessions or hopefully you have some of that. Um, but there is a there is a policy, a law called FERPA that limits how much we can share with, with families or anyone other than the student without the student's permission. And so generally if a family member is calling, we will ask to talk to the student first and get their permission to make sure that we can share information with families. That doesn't mean that we can't talk about resources, that we can't help you identify support for your student on campus, but it does sometimes limit us initially in how much we can share with you. That said, I always like to provide some general information um, about what our resources are so you as a family member can help your student when they have questions. So I think one of the most frequent ones is a maintenance issue. If there's something wrong, if there's something broken in the room, the light is flickering, the AC isn't working properly, oftentimes they'll call their families and the family's like, well, I don't, you know, you don't know the resources on campus. And so we do have a work order system. A student can submit a work order. If they don't know how to do that or they don't know where to find it, encourage them to talk to their RA. RAs know how to do it and can sit down with the student and show them how to do it. When a student submits a work order, they actually get email updates about the progress of it. So if they submit it themselves, they'll get an email saying this, it has been assigned to this person. This person stopped by and looked at it and they need a part. This person got the part and now they're installing it now. It's resolved. Um, so it's helpful when the student submits it themselves because they can get regular updates. If a student's having conflict with their roommate, encourage them to talk to their RA or stop by our office. Our office is in the Holland Union building, the hub where the dining hall is. So most students are visiting here at least once a day to get food. And so we're open traditional business hours and so they can always stop by, talk about options, um, or they can chat with our RA depending on kind of who's most successful and who they feel comfortable going to. If a student has an urgent issue that can't wait, so that example of the 2 a.m. and um, the heat isn't working, encourage them to contact the Department of Public Safety. As I mentioned earlier, they're open and available 24 seven, and they know how to access resources like facilities management or like folks from Res Life at that 2 a.m. hour when something urgent is needed. We also have a resident advisor on call during each evening. So from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m., an RA is available, um, and that information about how to contact that RA is shared during core meetings with your student. So resources available, but sometimes in the moment when something's going wrong, students struggle to think about what their resources are. And so as family members, you can be really helpful because most often they're gonna call you first about what do I do about this? And because you're not living it, you might not know, but my hope is that you'll know that resources are available and just to reach out and we can get you to the right place. If your student has a disability and requires a specific type of housing, encourage them to contact with Access and Disability Services. If you um, don't know how to do that, just reach out to either Sarah or ResLife and we can help connect you with them as well. Most likely you've already had some in contact with them, especially around academic accommodations, but also know that's the place to go for any housing accommodations too. Um, I like to always, when I have an opportunity to talk to families, talk about roommate relationships, because um, oftentimes this can be um, the source of um, uh, fear for some folks. I can remember um, many years ago when I was going into college, this was the thing I was most worried about. I had lived alone. I didn't have any siblings at home with me. So it was the first time that I was going to be sharing a room with somebody and I was terrified. And my first year was challenging. It's actually one of the reasons that motivated me to get involved in res life because I wanted to know how to do it better and how, how I could manage that. So we know that conflict is scary. And we also know that's very normal. Um, if you think about your relationships and you maybe think about your home, there's likely conflict that happens. I know I live with my partner and as much as I love living with him, love him as a person, we're still gonna have conflict, right? There's still gonna be things that come up. And so it's normal and it's okay. Um, but we also know that for most students, it's the first time that they're dealing with something like this and trying to figure out how do they communicate through conflict and how do they resolve um, challenges that come up. And so it's important for you to know that there are staff here that can help your student through that. They have their resident advisor, they have the professional staff in our office. These are opportunities. And so we will encourage them to identify their communication style, to try to talk directly to their roommate if it's appropriate. And that will be challenging at times, but it is our hope that they'll grow through that. 
Now, there are certain situations where that's just not going to be an option, right? Where there's a situation where there's a safety concern or it's just not working anymore. So if that's happening, please encourage your student or reach out to us and we can talk with them about what their options are. I also like to bring up the 10% rule, which you may have heard of or maybe not. Um, and 10% and uh, maybe is not exact, but I would say that 90% of life is great, right? 90% of our experience is fantastic. About 10% are going to be challenges, right? That's a pretty typical life. It's a pretty normal thing. And those 10 that 10% of the challenges is often what we focus on the most, especially when talking to folks. When I'm calling my best friend, I try to talk about the good things, but I'm also going to vent a lot. I'm going to focus on that 10%. And that's often what I find with uh, students and their families as well. They'll talk about the good stuff. They'll talk about the fun stuff, but they'll also spend a lot of time because you're their sounding board. You're the person who's going to listen to them and help them problem solve and um, consult. They're the, you're the person that they're going to consult with. So they're going to share that 10%. It's helpful to have that balance too, right? To acknowledge that this is 10% and there's probably 90% that's also going well. I think that's true with roommate relationships too, right? Or any of our relationships. So I just encourage as a family member to ask other questions too. Like, oh, you're talking a lot about um, what you're frustrated with your roommate. Are there things that you enjoy about your roommate? And if there aren't, then we should probably talk about a change. Uh, but trying to look for that balance as well that oftentimes it's that 10% of the frustrating stuff that we're talking about and venting about. I want to end by sharing a little bit of a timeline of what to expect um, in the next few weeks. So as I mentioned earlier, in the first week of August, housing assignments will be shared. And that's also the time that folks will sign up for a move-in time. The reason they sign up for a move-in time at that time is because we, we and they will know where they're living. And it, we're intentionally trying to spread out when people are moving into a specific place. So once you know you're living in Adams Hall, you'll be able to sign up for a move-in time at Adams Hall. August 25th is the move-in day for first years. Um, the 25th through 29th is orientation. The 30th is the first day of classes. December 19th at noon is when residential spaces close for break. So the day before is the last day of finals. Some students will be leaving in advance of that when their finals are over. Um, but the, that Sunday at noon is when our halls close and everyone leaves. Um, the 22nd and 23rd are when we open back up for spring semester. So those of you who are planners and thinking about um, coming back in January, especially those of you who have to book flights or travel, keep those dates in mind. And then similarly, May 18th at noon is when residential spaces close for summer. We remain open during fall pause, Thanksgiving break, and spring break. We close during winter break, but there are certain times where we have students here over winter break, including international students who are unable to travel home and some athletic teams who um, have competitions during winter break. Um, during fall pause, Thanksgiving break and spring break, meal plans may not always be available. It depends um, on kind of how many folks are staying and dining services staff and such is important to plan for if you do anticipate that your student may be staying over some of those breaks. For those of you who are planners, all future dates can be found on the residential calendar on the Dickinson website. So if you go to dickinson.edu, type in residential calendar, our calendar will pop up. Um, it's helpful to know as you think about future years that after students first semester, they move in the Saturday and Sunday before classes start. So in the first year they come about that Wednesday before so they can focus on orientation, um, but in future years, it's the Saturday and Sunday before classes start. Um, before we go to questions, I just want to point out that I do list our contact information on here. Reslife at Dickinson.edu is our email, and that's our phone number. Um, generally, you're going to talk to Lori, our fantastic ministry assistant. She's been here 13 years, so can help with most questions that folks have. And if not, she can make sure you get to the right person who can give you the quickest answer. So if you do have questions along the way, feel free to reach out. We'll help as much as we can or try to point you in the right direction. Um, but Sarah, are there some questions that came up in the Q&A that would be helpful to address? Yes, definitely. There are quite a few that have come in. Some are more specific. And like I said, we'll, we'll cover some of those as we can. And I'll just try and pick out a couple now that I think will be helpful for everybody. Um, so there were some questions about room dimensions. And I sent a link um, to that, which is listed on the website. But hopefully quickly, Amanda, can you just let us know if those room dimensions include the space of the closets? Do you know off the top of your head or should we follow up on that? 
I don't know. Um, okay. Once you get your room assignment, if you have a question about a specific room, I'd encourage you to reach out and we can let you know. I'm not, we have floor plans in our office here that we can look at to see what it includes. Yep. Okay, great. Um, you know, obviously there were some questions about the 40% of students who had requested roommates. Is that, do you think, pretty typical for first year students? Um, Good question. So we actually only maybe about, um, and I'm going to get the timing wrong, so I apologize, maybe five years ago, um, started to open up requests for rates. Before that, everything was random. Um, the last time I checked was, pro was 2019, and that was about 30 to 32%. Um, I'll also say the 40% is what it was a quick look. Um, and so the folks just submit information by July 1. And so we're still trying to figure out how many of those are mutual um, and how many. Um, we also see some students um, accidentally put something else in there. And so they don't actually put a roommate's name. They put their name because they think they're signing it. Um, and they may not have like read super carefully. And so we're at about 40. I think that might go down a little bit once we find some of those duplications of like folks didn't really understand what was happening. Um, and so it's fairly between 30 and 40% is fairly typical. Okay, great. Um, there were a couple of questions about um, student athletes and move in dates for them. And I don't know if you have the list of those in front of you um, or if a student's family has a conflict on the 25th of August, should they contact you directly about, you know, adjusting move in dates and all of that? So um, football will move in on Wednesday, the 11th and other um, fall athletes will move on on the 18th. I would encourage you to talk to your coach. And so if you're an athlete and you're not sure when you're supposed to come, please talk to your coach. They provide us a list of athletes who are coming early and when they're coming. So I would encourage you to connect with a coach if you're an athlete and you're not sure when you're coming. If you have a conflict for the 25th, reach out to reslife at dickinson.edu. Um, I would say that it can be challenging to change that because orientation starts pretty quickly that afternoon. And so if you're not able to be there that day, it's likely there you're gonna miss some orientation as well. And so we'd wanna talk about what that looks like and some options for you. But reach out to reslife at dickinson.edu and we can um, talk about what the options are. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions about fridge rentals, <laughs> um, yeah. which obviously is important. We want students to be able to stock up on all of their snacks and all of that. And I think that that information will come out um, with the room assignment, you know, for students to be able to request that. But if you could share something, that'd be great. Sure. So we do have micro fridges um, that are available for rent through the bookstore. And so if you do want to get ahead of it and get some more information, the bookstore would have it. You can also go to the dickinson.edu website, type in micro fridge, and it should pull up the link for you. Um, if you rent through the bookstore, they deliver it to the room. Um, if you do order in advance and you don't know your building and room, you can leave that blank and they'll later ask us after housing assignments are made what your building and room is so we can make sure it gets to the right place. But they deliver it at the beginning of the semester and they take it at the end of the semester, which is one of the benefits to it. Um, some folks will, will choose to bring their own, so they purchase it, um, which I think in the end is maybe a little bit more uh, fiscally reasonable. I think you would spend less money over time, but then you are responsible for carrying it into the building, into your room, and then removing it and storing it over the summer as well. So it just depends on what your priorities are. Um, but for a lot of folks will use the micro fridge rental just for convenience. And then a lot of students will also just purchase one and bring it every, every year. Um, we do have full-size fridges in our kitchens and all of the first year buildings have kitchens in them. And so there are students who will choose not to bring a fridge and just plan to use the full size one. Now, typically that's a community fridge. And so if any of us work in workplaces with a community fridge, you probably know what to expect with that. Mm -hmm. um, and that folks will forget to take things out um, and leave things in there. And so they can get pretty messy, but I do know some folks will choose just to use those depending on you know, how much, what they're planning on keeping. We'll have some students who um, choose to keep some yogurt in their room as breakfast. And then we have some students who will eat in the dining hall every single meal and may not need to keep much food in their room. So it's personal preference. 
Um, questions about the area coordinators and RAs. Um, are, could you maybe speak a little bit more to like the difference between those roles um, and also if area coordinators are located in all residence halls or just some and are you know, decisions behind that? Good question. Most of the time your student will interact with their RA. So the RA has either a floor or a building, depending on the size of the building of oversight. So they'll be the ones that your student meets on move in day, they host the floor meeting. Um, they're the folks that your students will go to for some of those common questions of how to find us, where to go for this. Um, we also have RAs on call in the evening, as I mentioned, that kind of serve as that more urgent issue. When a student's not sure where to go to, they can call the RA on call and the RA can call, call can either help or refer to DPS or somebody else. The area coordinators, they live on campus, but they're not necessarily in every building. Um, we have a good amount of buildings. We have about 50 some buildings on campus, um, residential spaces. And so we don't have one in every area, but they oversee um, groups of buildings. Most of the time your student would interact with them here in our office. Um, so they'll stop in and have a question. We'll ask what area they live in and we'll make sure that they connect with um, the area coordinator. Typically that happens if a student's not sure where to go. Um, maybe they haven't seen their RA in a few days and don't know how to, you know, connect with them or their RA is busy, or they just have a more personal concern that they don't want to talk to a peer about. They might reach out to their area coordinator. Um, generally, if you're calling into our office, we're doing the same thing. We're asking where your student lives and connecting you with the area coordinator that oversees that area. So these are folks who um, have gone and gotten their master's in uh, student affairs, student development, have experience within residence life and housing, um, and can help with some of the more delicate or higher level questions that folks might have. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions I'll just respond to quickly just about the orientation timeline um, and all of the, the dates that Amanda provided would um, respond to a transfer students timeline as well. It corresponds with that. So um, transfer students will also be moving in in the same time as our first year students um, for orientation. And a couple of questions just about how busy students are between that drop off date and the first day of classes. And, you know, generally they're pretty busy. They'll have a full schedule of orientation that will include floor meetings and meetings with their first year seminar and, you know, other opportunities to pursue job, jobs on campus and um, meetings with others, individuals, mentors. So it is a pretty busy time. Um, most families will come potentially the day before orientation, drop off their student and typically leave at the end of that day. Um, if you're traveling from a greater distance, we understand that, you know, some people might stick around in town and that's fine. Um, but your student will probably be pretty busy at that point in time. Yeah. Um, trying to look here. Um, fridge and microwave. There were some questions about um, the bathrooms, Amanda, and I, I know that, you know, every residence hall is different. Um, there were some questions, questions specifically about like, are there cubbies in the bathroom? And again, I'm sure every, there, it's different potentially in each <laughs> residence hall. Um, but could you maybe speak a little bit to that if you can broadly and also um, gender inclusivity bathrooms and how um, those are handled? Sure. So um, most first years will have will use a communal restroom, and that's true probably for sophomores and some juniors as well. So they could anticipate having a communal restroom. Um, depending on kind of where you're coming from, I, I, this seems uh, simple, but I also like to point out that every um, shower and toilet does have like a stall, either with a like hard door or a curtain at least. Um, I know kind of some old school places and I know this sounds silly, but one of the things I was concerned about when coming uh, to live at a college after I had seen things on TV was like these communal gym type showers. Everything has kind of a private space, but they are communal. I mean, you walk in and you have a set of showers, a set of toilets and a set of sinks. Um, this year we added a question on the roommate preference forum asking what bathroom that folks would use, whether it's a um, single sex women, single sex, sex men, or a gender inclusive option. And our hope is to house folks based on that. And so that if there is a group of students who would be using the gender inclusive restroom, we would house them in an area where there's a gender inclusive restroom available. We do have a handful of single user bathrooms. That means that you walk in and there's a sink and a toilet, sometimes a shower, but typically just a sink and a toilet and you shut the door behind you. Probably what most of us have in our households, um, we're familiar with that. All of those where it's a single user, those are all gender inclusive as well. So we have a handful of those in some common areas for easy accessibility. 
Um, as far as cubbies, a lot of the species do have cubbies, um, but not all of them. So it depends on the building. Um, and it depends a little bit on how easy they are to clean. So sometimes your student will probably get to know their housekeeper for the building pretty well. And their housekeeper will usually let them know what they hope. So there are some places that have cubbies, but they're a little bit hard to clean if, it, if they're filled. And so the housekeeper might ask you to remove the stuff for the day so that they can make sure that it's clean and tidy. Um, and easy, just clean. <laughs> I think we all want that. Um, so it depends a little bit on the cubbies, but I would say that most folks do use a shower caddy, even if they use a sh even if they leave the shower caddy in their cubby as a way just to collect their stuff easily. Great. Um, we're back to the microwave fridge question. <laughs> There's still a ton of questions in there. If they're unable to reserve one, um, well, first off, will they, do you know if they'll be notified if they are able to reserve one prior to coming? And if not, will they be able to purchase their own um, and do dimensions matter for that? Or is that something that we should respond to individually? Sure. So um, I don't believe with the exception of this past year, this past year was a little different because um, we are using a lot of the fridges for folks who had to quarantine or isolate due to COVID. But generally, um, I believe the bookstore has enough fridges for anyone who requests them. So if you'd want to rent one, you should be able to do that. Um, if they run out of stock, that would be published on their website. Um, if you choose to bring one, I pulled it up so I would remember exactly the size that we ask for. Um, it should be no larger than 4.1 cubic feet. To be honest, as long as you're not bringing a full size fridge, generally it's going to be okay. None of us are going to measure it. Um, it's just that it would be an issue if it's a full size fridge because of the electricity. We, we're not sure that a room could necessarily hold um, that many full size fridges. So if you choose to bring one, just try to keep it to a mini fridge and you'll be okay. Great. And there are refrigerators and microwaves and common areas, as you said, so students will have access to those as well. Um, there were some questions um, about uh, mailing items to students on campus, and it's my understanding I spoke with somebody in the mail center just the other day, and they will provide students with their hub box numbers prior to arriving, so probably in the next couple of weeks. Um, the hub box refers to the Holland Union building, which is the building on campus, the hub, um, where all of the mailboxes are. And that's where students will go to pick up their packages as well. Um, so once your student has that, once you receive that information, you are able to ship things to campus um, prior to orientation, prior to move in, so that you'll be able to access that when you come to campus. Um, they ask that you don't ship anything, you know, more than two weeks early, just because we don't, you know, there's a space issue if everybody's choosing to do this. So we want to make sure that we have enough space for um, everybody to be able to do that as well. Um, there were some questions about contacting RAs and just to confirm, they have floor meetings that first day, right? So they'll be able to meet with their RA right away. Okay. Um, let's see. There will be separate orientation for athletes. There will be kind of a, they'll follow a different schedule. So I saw that was on there. Um, so again, you'll be getting more information from your student's coach about that. And um, that will integrate into the traditional orientation because obviously we want student athletes to be a part of their classes orientation experience. But obviously there, there may be some parallel tracks that need to be accounted for given practices and all of that. Um, more questions about when to arrive in Carlisle. Um, you know, so move in day is on Wednesday this year. Again, depending on how far of a drive you have, you know, many families will be coming in just that day, but, um, you know, many others will also be renting hotels in the local area the night before or even two days before. You know, I, some families may not have made it to campus yet, just given all the travel restrictions and everything from last year. So, um, you know, use your own discretion and spend as much time as you would like to in Carlisle. But again, um, I will say, you know, after about four o'clock on not October on August 25th, your student will be off and running with their um, first year classmates and with their orientation group. Um, a couple of questions about locking cabinets and drawers and just kind of safety and um, of storage of personal belongings in the room. Do you ever recommend, uh, you know, facilities that that lock for families? 
So the, um, the existing furniture does not have locks on it. Mm -hmm. um, I do know some students will choose to bring a small safety box, like if they wanna keep jewelry or meds in it. Um, and I think that's a personal preference. I don't believe the majority of students do that. Um, generally, if a student, um, again, I'm, we're hoping that they're locking their bedroom door as they leave, um, and that will keep their personal items safe. Um, I, it's my experience that when theft does occur on campus, it is typically, um, it, inc it includes an unlocked door. Um, we, we don't necessarily have, you know, break-ins necessarily, but um, the few times that I have known theft to happen um, has, has been when somebody has left their door wide open usually, um, not even shutting it. Um, so I think it's a personal preference uh, about how, you know, what you're, what you and your student are most comfortable with. So I will, there are some students who will bring like a little lockbox just to keep meds or um, jewelry or cash in. Um, but I would say that's probably not typical of most, but you may want to consider it depending on what you're bringing to campus. Um, and I would just encourage you to have conversations with your student about safety and keeping things, you know, keeping their door, locking their door, taking their key with them um, to, to keep themselves safe as well. Um, there were a couple questions about bike storage on campus. Yes, you know, we're a bike friendly campus, a bike friendly town. There are places for students to lock and, um, you know, save their, or um, park their bikes in covered areas. Um, a couple of questions about laundry machines and how that's operated you could respond to that. Yeah, that's a great question. Also, if you don't mind, I'll add about bikes. When you come to campus, mm -hmm. um, we will have our public safety officers that are help directing traffic. And most of them will have a bike registration form with them. So when you come to campus, if you're bringing a bike, um, feel free to ask any of them or if they have a bike registration form, you can register your bike with DPS. And then if it, um, I think most often students leave at places and forget where they've left it, DPS can help track it down. Um, or if it's in a spot where it needs to move, they can contact you so I encourage you to register your bike with DPS and again that can happen on move-in day um, but about laundry so all of our first year buildings have laundry within the building students will use an app to be able to um, start it so that they can track like when their cycle's done when they should go to switch it over to the dryer um, and so students receive um, uh, uh, I can't remember the number, I apologize because it's been like a year and a half since we've had to do this, but you receive um, some kind of loads up front that comp for either washer or dryer. So they receive some up front. If they use all of them, then they can purchase more and put money onto it to purchase more kind of cycles through the washer or dryer. So for our first year's uh, laundry room in each building, it's used through an app and the RA will cover that information um, during the first floor meeting. There's also some signage around the laundry rooms as well. Um, so no need. I know the when I went to college, I brought quarters and I was, you know, we were collecting quarters as we were coming to college. So no need to do that anymore. It's all through an app. Um, and it makes it really convenient to track also when your laundry is done, which is pretty nice. Um, I'll respond to this. There, there are some virtual tours and videos that are posted to the website. So for those who were unable to come to our campus because of COVID and you want to see some images of the residence halls, please feel free to go on and check that out. Um, there are a couple of questions about storage, uh, either during winter months, you know, do students move, move out completely during the winter? Do they store anything? Um, and what about storage at the end of the year? And then kind of a part two of that, um, parents of athletes who are curious about if their athlete is on campus during the winter, do they stay in their residence hall or are they moved about? Great questions. Um, so students, if they are staying in the same place from fall to spring, they can leave belongings in their space over winter break. If they would choose, some students will choose to move to a new space for winter break, they would fully move out in the fall and move back in the spring, but that's a rare number of students. Most students will leave things there over winter break. Um, for the summer, we do ask that students remove everything from campus. We don't have any on-campus storage um, available. Some students, we do have a list of storage options on our website. A lot a lot of students will go in together on a storage unit, um, especially those from farther distances. They'll, you know, maybe five students will share a storage unit. Um, we also offer um, some other options, including some opportunities where um, somebody will come to campus, pick up boxes, go store them, and then bring them back um, the following August. 
Um, for athletes who are staying over winter break, the majority of them will stay in their spaces. Um, sometimes we will move them if they're the only student in a space. So for example, if there's just one student in one building that's returning, um, generally we'll find another space for them because that is a little scary and a little weird to be on a pretty empty campus. Um, we also, there are some buildings that the heat is turned off over winter break. And so we would not have somebody stay there um, over winter break. We would find another location for them. Great. Um, a couple of things I can respond to here. Just more questions about orientation. There will be a full schedule that will be posted soon, I imagine really soon. Um, so between August 26th and the start of classes on August 30th, um, there will be many events that are programmed for your students as they get to know one another, as they get to know campus and the greater Carlisle community. Um, will they need hiking stuff uh, or shoes or anything? um for orientation i i don't believe so um but your student can you know um reach out to uh, colleagues in the student leadership and campus engagement office if they're perhaps participating in a program that would take them outdoors but we also have um this, like a lot of that equipment that can be rented on campus um as well there are some questions about shuttles um, whether things are walking distance in the Carlisle area and the majority of the places your student will want to get to um, are within walking distance. But if you have anything you want to share about shuttles or availability, Amanda. Um, sure. Um, yeah, most of the places are within walking distance. Um, DPS does provide um, a shuttle during certain hours that typically does loop to Walmart, which is helpful as well. Um, and um, I know some people, Walmart is also technically within walking distance. Um, so a lot of students will just walk there if they want to, um, depending on what you're buying. It is a walk. And so depending on what you're buying, you may not want to do that, but that's also an option for folks. Um, but I think a lot of people honestly buy online and have it shipped to um, the hub because that's the most convenient for most students don't want to take the time to try to figure out how to get somewhere else and then come back. But I would say the majority of restaurants um, and small shops like little bookstores, um, some vintage clothing stores, things like that are just downtown within walking distance. And so I think the majority of our students, um, like when they're going out to eat, will often just do within walking distance because um, there's plenty of stuff downtown. Great. Um... There will be numbers to provide to reach on-call RAs. Is that, uh, that okay? Yep, they'll get they'll that given in the floor meeting. Okay, great. Um, looking forward, uh, you know, some questions about whether uh, the residence halls are conducive for studying. And I think that that really depends on your students' habits and, you know, how they adjust. Um, there are, you know, we again to Amanda's earlier points, we try to pair students together with other students who share the same study habits and, um, you know, approach to that as well. Um, but we have a beautiful library on campus if that's a preference for many students as well. Um, and I'm looking through, I, we do obviously still have some other open questions, but I think they're mostly generally uh, related to the themes that we have responded to already. Um, and again, you know, I want to thank Amanda for her time. I want to thank all of you for your time here today. I know that there will be many other um, specific questions as well. Oh, wait, we're getting a lot of questions about airport shuttles. So before, <laughs> before I shut down, I do think we should talk about that. Um, and typically there are shuttles um, to the Harrisburg Airport. Um, and I'll have to check the public safety website again, just to get those specifics, but all of that is managed through the Department of Public Safety. Um, we do offer shuttles during, you know, major weekends and travel to um, and from campus. And so um, that it should be something that your students should be able to register for and arrange through the Office of um, Public Safety. Am I missing anything on that? No, you're good. And if you if you're somebody who is uh, ambitious and want to find that link yourself, if you go to Dickinson.edu and you type in shuttles, um, they have a specific transportation website with some information and would also have DPS's contact information. And we have a transportation coordinator who oversees that. So you could reach out directly to her um, with any questions that you might have. She's super helpful. Great, great. And then um, 
Yeah, you know, I think that that's the majority of what we can cover here today. We do have a parents Facebook page. I want to mention that because I know that a lot of families are communicating with one another on there. Um, we will post this link once we're able to get it downloaded and, um, you know, uh, buffered, I guess, for everybody's viewing pleasure. And you'll be able to share that with other families as well. So if a family member of yours was unable to attend, please feel free to share this with them. Um, if you have any additional questions, we will be downloading a copy of these questions and trying to follow up with you. Um, you know, some attendees uh, contact information is more available than others who might have joined anonymously. So if you don't hear from us, please follow up with reslife at dickinson.edu so we can respond to your specific questions or follow up with me at parents at dickinson.edu. Um, we'll also be posting this to the website and I'll inform uh, members, uh, parents of members of the class of the 2025 of where this is posted once we get it on the website. Um, so again, thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing this wealth of information. Um, this has just been wonderful uh, for me too, to be refreshed on all of this great information about our students' residential experience at Dickinson. Um, and anything else that you'd like to say before we log off for the day? No, thank you, Sarah. And um, I look forward to meeting you all super soon. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out um, and we'll do our best to answer them. Hope everyone has a good afternoon. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Bye.